I'd like to welcome you to this edition of EMU Today TV with my co-host Alexis Barron. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you today? I'm doing just fine. We have a great show lined up. Yes, we do. All right, let's just jump right into it. I'd like to welcome Professor Barry Pyle of, uh, in the political science area. He's the coach of the Moot Court and the Mock Trial team here at Eastern Michigan University. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, congratulations. We have a national championship team here at Eastern Michigan. Who are That's these? That's right. Uh, so two weeks ago, uh, we won the American Moot Court Association National Championship. It's the only national organization dealing with undergraduate moot court in the country. Uh, the two students that won are Charles Graham and Kelsey Hall. Yeah, and, and so you've been here since 1997, I believe, right? Correct. I've been in the Department of Political Science. I teach uh, courses in public law, constitutional law, and public policy. And how long have we had the moot, I guess the moot, the moot court program, essentially? For that right, kind of so uh, mock trial has been here Thank for you. 20 years. Uh, moot court has been here for seven. Okay, and, and tell us exactly what is, what is the moot court? Okay, so moot court simulates arguing before the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, so both, there are two sides. Uh, they take one position on a constitutional question. The other university or school or team would take the other side. This year it was the Fourth Amendment and cell phones and whether or not the government can use cell phones to locate criminal defendants and whether or not the state could refuse to allow children to testify at a trial. So before the win, I wasn't really sure that we even had a moot court team. What is the difference between moot court and mock trial exactly? So mock trial has been here for almost 20 years and it's more like what you would normally see on television on a uh, legal show. So witnesses, attorneys arguing about evidence and things like that. But once you get up to the U.S. Supreme Court, it's basically just about arguing legal concepts what is or is not constitutional or consistent with a given statute. Okay. And this is a very prestigious uh, championship for the university, correct? It is. Uh, what makes it so special? Um, I think we are only the third public institution to win this award. Generally it's gone to private schools uh, and a lot of very elite liberal arts schools. Uh, other than Youngstown State and uh, Cal State, Long Beach, I believe we are the only uh, public school title holder of this title for the last 22 years. And as we were doing our research, I realized that you beat some outstanding universities. Mm -hmm. so why don't you name a few of those uh, universities that we beat? Uh, well, I, <laughs> I didn't make an argument, but Kelsey and Charles beat. Oh, I, I know, said, I know. Yes, that's, that's correct. Uh, uh, no, we beat uh, uh, two of the uh, uh, likely winners uh, based on last year's performance uh, from the University of Chicago. Uh, the University of Southern California, and then Youngstown State, a previous title holder. Uh, at the tournament were schools from everywhere from Harvard University uh, through uh, Duke University and, uh, well, Eastern. Outstanding. So how do students prepare themselves for something like this? Is there a certain process that you have them go through or is it just kind of wing it kind of thing? No, <laughs> there's no winging involved. Uh, so we're given a case and then we're given between 10 and 15 precedents uh, to work off of, uh, older court decisions. And the students and I sit down and we work through arguments. So they have to understand the law, they have to understand the decisions that the court has made, and then they take from that and apply arguments to their particular case. So uh, moot court members started working on this case back last May. Uh, and we worked at it through the fall uh, up until we began our regional competitions late in late fall, then the national competition in January. And, and, and as with any, I'm going to just make the correlation to a second for a second with sports, uh, people mm -hmm. have tryouts to make the team. Uh, what are some of the criteria for these students to make this team to perform at the next level? Well, they have to be able to understand complex uh, concepts in constitutional law. They have to be able to speak. Uh, we do all of our arguments from memorization, so they have to be able to argue about f or memorize up to 45 minutes to an hour's worth of material. Uh, the way it works is you start making your argument and just like at the U.S. Supreme Court, the justices can start asking you questions. Uh, for example, uh, Kelsey and Charles had a round uh, where I believe uh, Charles said, my name is Charles Graham, and then he answered questions for 10 minutes. And we can't predict what those questions are. So you have to be able to speak on your feet 
and you have to be able to prepare and memorize a mass amount of material. So we do hold tryouts. Um, I tried to give an opportunity to as many students as I possibly can. This year we fielded nine separate teams, so 18 teams of Eastern students competed uh, throughout the Midwest, and then two of them made it to the national competition. So the competition is tough? The competition is very tough. Yeah. There were 500 teams that started this year, uh, and then we ended up on top. And, and how many EMU students actually will go through this tryout phase to become, to get on our, the, the moot court? Okay, uh, this year we yes. started with about 30 kids. 30 kids. Um, and then either by attrition or just, uh, you know, we're given a limited number of spots, so I'm forced, my hands are tied, so I have to uh, ask some students not to compete, and then they're given another opportunity to do it next year. And what is the tryout process like for students that want to join moot court? Basic arguments, uh, giving them a couple of smaller types of arguments to make, um, see if they can answer questions. Uh, a lot of it is just being able to process and speak publicly fairly clearly. Um, it's so mixing that intellectual side of it with a public presentation side of it. So are there like levels to these tryouts? Is it like first they are going to do this, then they do this, then they do this, and then you kind of wean it down? Or? No, um, I think it's a, it's a lot less informal uh, than there might be on an athletic uh, tryout. Uh, so a lot of it is uh, their willingness to come to practice two times a week for three or four hours a, a, at a shot. Uh, and also uh, just working through the arguments, a lot of kids kind of self-select themselves out uh, by not doing the preparation work. Again, I treat this as a co-curricular activity, so I tried to bring in as many people as possible. And are the students that come in, for example, uh, do they have past experience in high school? So in other words, were they involved in a similar program back at their local high schools to prep them for the university level? Not so much moot court. Uh, there's lots of high school mock trial programs. Uh, some of the students who do moot court also do our mock trial. It just happens to be that Kelsey and Charles are also the uh, team captains of our top mock trial team uh, at the university and, and they're nationally ranked there as well right now. Uh, but that's a team of eight which they lead. So there are kids who come in with some legal competition experience. But moot court is very rare, and it's, it's a relatively new thing at the undergraduate level, only like the last 20 years. Uh, but it's, it's basically the dominant thing that's done at law schools when it comes to uh, academic competition is they do moot court. And a lot of the students have gone through the moot court. Uh, have they gone mm -hmm. on to law school, or what's, what's, been the, what's been the next level for them? So uh, there's a litany of very, very successful students who've done moot court and mock trial. Uh, I would say, well, we've sent uh, one young man to Harvard, uh, two to the University of Virginia, um, four to the University of Michigan right down the road. Uh, so our top moot quarters have gone on to top six law schools. <laughs> and that's impressive. And, no, it is. And, I mean, that's very impressive. And, and, and I saw all the, the media coverage at EMU mm -hmm. today, the print edition, talking about this program. And I believe they were acknowledged, they, didn't they receive a certificate or something from the state of Michigan or yeah. what was the award that they received? Okay, so Michigan? the uh, Michigan State Supreme Court Michigan has state a proclamation uh, claiming, uh, it was a resolution by the court uh, claiming the success of Eastern Michigan in a national competition. And so this competition takes place every year or is it every other year? How often does it, is, it take place? It is every year. Um, you have to earn spots to the national tournament through a series of regional competitions. Uh, and it's been every year for the last 22 years. Where was the competition held this year? It was in Baton Rouge, uh, Louisiana. Uh, it was at uh, Southern University uh, and a historic HBCU. Um, and it was a wonderful experience. It was... Um, it was a unique experience to be at a historical black college and university. You know, it's, and there's nothing like going to one of those institutions, and that's a fabulous historical institution, and students who go down there really enjoy the experience of being down there. Uh, have you talked to them? Obviously, you've talked to them since the competition. <laughs> are they still on cloud nine, or are they kind of like come back down to earth? Um, and say, I need to go back to class to get my homework done yeah, as well. Yeah, there's some of that. There's a little cloud nine, uh, but there's a lot more of we're getting ready for our, our uh, mock trial regionals 
And so we're right back at it, trying to get ready on that side of our competition. And when will those trials be held, the mock trial? Okay, so two weeks from today, on beginning on the 14th, and then uh, a series of more competitions the week afterwards. You know, we have less than a minute remaining, so tell our audience that might be watching right now how they can find out more information about this program. If they have a student that's interested in getting engaged as well, what do mm -hmm. you say to them? Uh, simply uh, uh, go to my department's website uh, or go to the EMU website and type in mock trial or moot court. There's a lot of information there. There's a series of videos that have been posted of us in action. Um, and uh, they can contact me directly through the uh, Department of Political Science. You know, Lex, is another reason to be proud. Yeah, of our, I, that's amazing. I knew we had a great forensics team, and now to know that we have a great moot court team as well, I'm just really proud to be a part of the school and all that we do. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Thank and you much very much. Much continued success. And again, uh, Professor Barry Powell from the Political Science Area, coach of the moot court and mock trial team. And just recently, we just celebrated the MLK a uh, weekend and a with a series of events. So Jaden Schwartz takes us across the campus to go check it out. One of the things that MLK has done for me, he's taught me how to be a better man, not to judge people. Don't judge people based on how they look or what you may think they are to be. Judge them for their character, for their values, and for their morals. People gathered at Eastern Michigan University on January 20th as part of the school's 34th annual celebration of the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Several attendees took the time to speak with us and reflect on what Dr. King's teachings and legacy have meant to them. He did something that was very unorthodox and unusual in his time. He took a leap and then from that he motivated other black people to follow along. So I think in all things that we do is about being bold and making that extra effort to be a little bit different and even do the things that are scary because none of what he did was easy at all. But he still strived, he still pushed through, he still motivated, he still connected. And I think that's really important to always remember that he was bold and to remember that we have that boldness inside of us as well. It's one thing to really talk about it, but it's another thing to be about it. So I feel like for those people who are actually stepping outside their box and making change, I commend you and I'm trying to be like you. We have a keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Terrence Roberts, who was one of the Little Rock Nine, who um, in 1957 was one of eight students to be the first to desegregate the school system by um, going to Central High School. The people who were there, who had the right to be there before we did, were not happy to see us in the main. I think they saw us as opening the door and there'd be an onrush of black people crowding them out. I think, the uh, more I think about it, I think that's one of the overriding fears we have today in this country. And unfortunately, that mindset is so pervasive. So we had to deal with that. Now, if I were to change anything, it would be having dialogue. I would want to sit down, perhaps at the end of each day, and have representatives from the group of oppressors and some of us from the group of nine to discuss choices, responses, actions taken. I think that would have been valuable and important. What's most important to me is the commitment to justice and seeing it through and seeing it for black people and seeing that we have to keep up with the equal opportunities. We have to keep fighting for opportunities for people to get inside the door. I mean, Dr. King, um, he, he changed everything for everybody. Um, he talked about courage and standing up for people that, you know, standing up for other people. Um, and having a program like this, it keeps him alive and it keeps what he believed in alive. Um, it definitely motivated me to have the old inspiration to want to dream. Um, the dream of my dreams actually being here right now um, from being a part of Eastern at one point and now actually on my way back on my second round just to finish up my bachelor's degree. Dr. King was so important to, to this country and to the world and it's very important that we all you know, take a moment, stop, pause and reflect on all the great work that he did, all the great work that has been done over the years and take some time to think about all the great work that we still need to do. Dr. King has had an impact on my life. Um, uh, he just started the ball rolling on diversity and civil rights, and uh, I think we do have a long way to go still, but I think that we're continuing what his teachings were. It's actually too early to celebrate, because what he stood for is still in the distant future. And so I think what we do is recognize the 
part he's played. Uh, at some point, I hope we will have the time to celebrate, because at that point we'll be celebrating not only his life and, and legacy, but the fact that his work has paid off, that there's actually fruit as a result of what he did. Amon K's meshes of love and unity and community are some of the most important values that we need to continue embedding in our country. And I think that it, if we keep those values, it will help us get through the dark days that our country goes through. The civil rights movement was bigger than just that march. It was a forever stand about human issues and equality. And for me, that's what's, this is so important and why I've been a part of it as many years as we can to still carry this mission on. I think the most important thing to remember about Martin Luther King is that he had his challenges, he had his ups and downs, but he still took that extra mile to be great. And we have to remember that we are capable of doing that. So as we walk into that room, as we walk into meeting new people and being in different atmospheres, to always understand that we have the power to be great and to exude excellence every single day. And that was a great celebration in honor of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I had the opportunity of attending the events there. I had the opportunity to speak as well. It was just fantastic. Thank you, Jaden, for that fabulous, fabulous report. All right, we're going to continue the conversation with Ms. Julie Yawn, and she's an associate professor for the health promotion and human performance area. Mm -hmm. And yeah. welcome. Thanks for coming <laughs> to EMU today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks to you, Alexis, mm -hmm. as well. Thanks for letting me come and talk. And um, I am so happy to be here, and I'm very passionate about giving people opportunities to move and to be healthy. That's what our entire school is about in health promotion and human performance on the academic side, preparing future professionals. And I also love showcasing what Eastern has to offer for its current students who may not be choosing a major necessarily mm -hmm. in those areas, but we also have some really good opportunities that my programs partner with. So I would love to chat about those today. Well, you know, when I first met you, we were both talking to EMU football recruits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and Julie and I have the opportunity of, of talking to football recruits as, as they're considering coming to mm -hmm. campus. But I remember asking you a question, and I want you to clarify for our viewing audience yeah. here about, I said, well, is it uh, sports marketing? And you mm -hmm. said, no. Yeah. So in the School of Health Promotion and Human Performance, there are six different undergraduate majors, and they all deal in some facet with sport, fitness, physical activity, that space, that kind of space, movement, education, safety, that kind of thing. And so one of the main majors I teach in and, and I'm program coordinator for is sport performance and fitness entrepreneurship. Okay. It's fairly new. It's kind of starting as a small major, but growing. And we would love to have more people. And we get quite a few athletes who do choose that. And what sport performance and fitness entrepreneurship is, it's for individuals who are passionate, are passionate about helping people move. They want them to learn how to exercise, to learn how to move their bodies, make healthy choices. Those are individuals who are gonna be ready to work out of their undergraduate degree in fitness, in strength and conditioning, and personal training, maybe sport coaching if they wanna make that their career, and even anything in fitness, recreation, corporate wellness, it's a big, big area. So they're hands-on with athletes and with movers versus sport marketing or sport management, really integral also to sport, but that's more of the back end and mm. the operations, the administration behind the scenes. Even though they know athletes and they're with them, they're not training them in how to be faster or stronger. That's what my students are doing. Got it. So as a professor, what are the kinds of classes like specifically that you teach sure. about health promotion? Yeah, absolutely. So in the sport performance major, I teach several classes from the beginning towards the end. We have a lot of practical classes and a lot of methods-based classes. We want this to be a very hands-on major. And so I teach anywhere from our intro to the profession class, which goes over just the history of how do we move and why do we move, all the way into methods classes. So a unique class I teach is called Methods of Holistic Fitness. And that's one where we look at mind-body connection with movement, mindfulness, and what are all the things a coach or a personal trainer might need to do to help an athlete or you know my grandma who's trying to be more fit or any of you who want to be more active what are the things that we have to do beyond just the physical training of their body and so how do we help motivate them what are some of the behavioral skills and habits
students, we help teach them. So I teach a class like that, that not only hits on the physical training, but also the mental and the emotional side. And I know that you and I, we shared a student last semester yeah. back in the fall, and you were sharing with me how, you know, obviously what he was doing and things like that, we're not going to go there. <laughs> but my point is, um, you, you told me that you encourage your students to get active in that area, whether it's an internship yes. or, and I think he was trying to get a, a particular internship in that yeah, field as well. Talk to, right well, there you go. Talk to us yeah. about that. Yes. So the other part of this is like, as we know, with any college degree, you have to take classes. There's a book knowledge, right? Um, but in coaching and sport performance, it's a very people driven industry. It's dealt with relationships and trust and, and employment in that field is really hinges on more than just credits and getting the degree. It also hinges on your credibility and your ability to be confident, to present yourself. Um, in essence, as a trainer, as a strength coach, you have a brand, which is yourself, yeah. that you're trying to convince people to do hard things like squats and burpees. And so you need a good rapport. And so we really encourage our students through guest speakers, through bringing alumni in, we place them in practicum early on. We offer some independent study opportunities if they have a really unique interest like that student had, if we, if we capture that. And then they have a full-time internship at the end where they're fully immersed in um, a gym, in a fitness center, in a strength and conditioning center, like ours here on campus, potentially is one a site where our interns go to. So it's a very hands-on approach where we're trying to make it as real world as possible. So you mentioned the one class, but do you have any more recommendations for students who are at, at a beginner level for fitness, like myself, who yeah. want to get into a healthier lifestyle? Absolutely. So in the School of Health Promotion and Human Performance, in addition to just the academic majors that we have, like sport performance major, we also have physical education general classes. We call them PEGN. That's the prefix, mm -hmm. if anyone wants to find one. Mm -hmm. And those are courses that students can take that are just you move in the class. There's usually not homework. It's participation, some simple things, some reflective pieces. And it's just about to get the student moving and to teach them good technique and maybe some of the history about what they do. So for example, I teach yoga in our physical education general track or program. And so I have most of my students are new to yoga. They've never taken it before here in that class. And we progress them from brand new beginners. And then the goal is at the end of the semester, the end of the course, that they feel confident enough in themselves to be able to do yoga on their own or go into a yoga studio in the community mm -hmm. and know what to do and make some of those choices and so I really encourage anyone to take those PEGN classes there's several different fitness options there's sport based options in those classes aquatics there's safety first aid everything that would be in that realm of movement and helping that movement experience be I will tell you Alexis that, that we're talking to a an expert <laughs> and and the reason I say that because I also know that you work out and and you're a, you, you lift weights you're a weight lifter is that right yeah so so this and this is this ties into my students to the major so when I'm talking to a recruit or an incoming freshman or their parents and we talk about the sport performance major we talk about a lot of them are athletes or in high school they may be doing something and that's something I always knew when I was younger I wanted to continue to I was an athlete like you were in track and mm -hmm. field um, and I wanted to, co to continue that in my career too and so when I'm talking to my students who maybe are movers or athletes right now you know you, you'll have a lifetime your competitive career may end and this is a way to still stay involved very hands-on in sport and we also educate them on that sport and competition and physical activity can continue in your lifetime so I picked up a new sport I picked up Olympic weightlifting wow. when I turned 35 because there's masters competition in Olympic sports and so it's a fun thing I train and do on the side and Get to get to enjoy being an athlete in a new sport later on in life as well. <laughs> so, so talk to us about one of your colleagues, mm -hmm. like me. Yeah, um, a little bit more mature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and uh, is it too late for you to save me in terms of getting me to work out? Absolutely not. <laughs> and like my, I get my grandma to work out. Yeah. She's eighty nine. Well, so. I'm not quite that old. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the places I love on campus is actually going through a renovation right now, and so we're yeah. really excited for the rec I am to fully reopen in. Of 20, um, I would bring you over to the rec center because the renovations are actually they're partially done, and there's anything that you can do. And so myself and my students, that's what we train them to do: how to bring in a new mover. Maybe it's been a while. Yeah. You know, you're a former athlete. 
And with what they have, with the body they have right now, things that they can do. We find things they enjoy. We challenge them. We show them new exercises okay. or new movements. We show them correct technique. We progress or regress according to their fitness level, what their goals are, maybe any limitations that they may currently have their ability level. And so that's the unique thing that someone who goes through a bachelor's degree and this program is really going to be, is, is going to learn and is going to know and be confident in doing. So we could have a conversation. Well, go we'll we'll definitely have a conversation. <laughs> I could put, whip you into shape. Well, whatever your goals okay. are, we'll do. <laughs> Same with you. <laughs> I feel like as a college student, there aren't enough people that take advantage of all of these educational health and wellness classes that we offer because you don't have to go to school and just learn about your major. You can learn about how to live a healthier lifestyle. Do you know of some examples of health promotion that we have on campus that people might not take advantage of? Absolutely, there's there's a lot actually, and one really positive thing I've seen recently, as I know um, just people being more aware of their health and becoming more aware of mindfulness and mental health comes into place. I'm seeing more little things, signages on campus about opportunities. One big space I wanna send people is to, um, again, the rec center. Um, it's currently open, has some modified spaces, and they have the, some of the friendliest staff on campus it's also a great place to work so if any students are looking for a job they hire students all the time um, and so it's a great place to recreate they have intramural sport fitness they have amazing personal trainers they have group fitness classes I teach yoga at the Rex group fitness classes mm -hmm. so that's great so it's, I always send people there too and it's, it's kind of a if you don't go in there um, you don't know it's there but I recommend ask go there, ask questions, people will help you. Um, the next place we have on campus is the Office of Wellness and Community Responsibility, and they host so many different events throughout the year, a lot at finals when things get stressful. Oh, yeah. um, so we see a lot with the mental health side, especially lately, but I know, for example, they do deep house yoga once a month at the student center, so they have lights and deep house music, and it's a really cool experience. They bring in animals. Um, rat, they had, I think, rabbits lately, <laughs> and dogs for stress relief um, they will hold workshops related to financial wellness and um, spiritual wellness there's a lot of things through the office of wellness so that's a place I always want to say it's not like students go there but they host quite a few events so keep uh, keep your eyes peeled for those we have about a minute remaining so we can wrap up but I want to ask you is that field growing here at Eastern how is it growing exponentially or relatively yeah. stable growth it's, it's been growing, so our whole school, Health Promotion and Human Performance, all of the majors in there has seen pretty rapid growth in the last, I would say, decade. And, and as we see, people are becoming more aware of their bodies and wanting to live a healthier life, yeah. wanting to have a good quality of life, they're making some choices and they need professionals to guide them. That's what my students do. Yeah, you know, I think this is a great conversation as we wrap up because, I, as you mentioned, a lot of people are going through that a healthy cycle mm -hmm. and now we're offering a program here at Eastern Michigan mm -hmm. very quickly how can they get more information so they can go to our school's website health promotion and human performance um, we also are on Instagram so the EMU sport performance major you can look to see my students help run that account so you can see what they're up to as well and they can contact me individually through the program outstanding and I want to thank you Julie for coming in and sharing the information Alexis, thank you as well. And thank you for watching EMU Today TV. And we will check you out next time and give you the latest on what the, happen the latest happenings are here at Eastern Michigan University. Have a great week.